Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to see some of my students' names on here and some familiar faces. For those of you that I don't know, my name is Heidi Brown, and I'm a professor at the law school, director of the legal writing program. And I want to introduce my awesome colleague, Professor Aisha Ames. And tonight we're going to talk to you about thriving and flourishing as lawyers. So we thought we'd talk a little bit about why the two of us are interested in this topic and sort of what led us to start thinking about this on a deeper level. And then um, we'll segue into sort of what the agenda is gonna be and we'll kind of take it from there. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about me, if you don't know me, my poor students have heard these stories a million times, but I was a construction lawyer it, for about 15 years before I started teaching law. And I've been teaching, this is my 12th year teaching law. So I was in this like rough and tumble industry. And those of you that do know me or have read some of my writing um, know that I grappled a lot with fear and anxiety and stress um, during my entire law practice. And I, I just kind of kept doing the same things over and over again without really being very self-aware. And, and then when I started teaching, I saw sort of the same stressors and anxieties in my students. And so I started studying well-being and, and how to sort of untangle fear. And I wrote a book about introversion and then a book about fear. But at the same time, I started taking boxing lessons. And in doing that physical activity, I started learning a lot more about how our stress and anxiety and fears as lawyers or law students or law professors um, it really has such a physicality to it, but we don't talk about our bodies that much in law school or, or in law practice. We just kind of think about our brains and our intellect. So it got me thinking, what if we started treating ourselves like scholar athletes? Like when I was in college, I was always kind of envious of the students who were, you know, excelling in the classroom, but also played a sport and they were called scholar athletes. And I just thought that was such a cool term. And if sports doesn't resonate for you, you know, maybe you could think of yourself as a, as a scholar performer, as a lawyer. Um, and athletes and performers, you know, they don't just focus on the one skill that, that helps them obtain glory in, on the field or in the arena or on the stage. They cultivate multiple dimensions of their performance. And I really think that we can do the same thing as law students and lawyers. So I'm gonna share a little bit about some things that have worked for me in that regard. And, and you know, we'll just kind of see where we take it from there. So Aisha, Professor Ames, do you wanna talk about your journey a little bit? Sure, so thank you, Professor Brown. Um, so it's good to see all of you kind of virtually today. Um, so my journey to the wellness was actually a personal journey. So similar to what Professor Brown stated, it came from um, a place of what did I need in that moment? So I've been practicing yoga probably about 20 years, and I probably got most serious about it when I started studying for the bar exam. It was one of those things that I found to be extremely stressful. Like I had, I had a career before I went to law school and then I went to law school and I had this exam and I was like, wait, I had a career before I came here and now I'm, and now everything's riding on this one exam. So it brought me a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. And so I would just, I um, started practicing practically daily, really early in the morning. And I realized that it really set the framework for, um, for who I was as a being, who I was in the day and who I hope to be. So one of the ways in which I kind of took that, my wellness background was I actually used that sort of in my professional career. And I formed like a yoga law business and a yoga law consulting businesses where I just have clients from all around the country who are yoga studios and, and yoga teachers. And, and just kind of seeing how that wellness, how they view wellness, even running, you know, huge businesses um, especially some of them still in a pandemic, how like how their view of wellness not only plays out into what the what the methodology is in their studios, but also in how they run their daily lives. And all of this is very stressful. So it's so it's really I'm really grateful to work with such people who kind of impart wellness all the time. So today we're going to talk about um, Professor Brown is going to talk about youth stress and prehabilitation. And then I'm going to give some basic tips on incorporating wellness into your daily life. 
And then we're actually going to do a chair yoga class. I'm going to lead a chair yoga class for you. It's a way to kind of move a bit more. So if you're thinking about it now, just to prep, if you're in a chair that rolls or is not too stable or is 120 years old, you might want to kind of get a more stable foundation for that class. And, and it'll be accessible for anyone and there will be modifications. So please don't fret. You will do what feels best for you. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Professor Brown, who's going to talk about use stress and prehabilitation. Yes, yeah, so and just to set up this conversation, so you might be wondering why on the screen there's a Virginia State Bar rule of professional conduct and not New York. We're all New Yorkers here. But I actually started practicing law when I lived in Virginia, and I was really excited to recently learn that um, the, the Virginia bars actually incorporated well-being into their rules of professional conduct in this comment seven to rule 1.1. And I love this paragraph, you know, our, our mental, emotional, and physical well-being really relates to our competence as lawyers. So this is not just some touchy-feely thing we're going to talk about it's sort of on the side of, of our lives as lawyers. This is integral in our journey as law students and lawyers. We, we owe it to ourselves and our clients to start really thinking about our mental, emotional, and physical well-being as a part of our job and our, our role. And that's why I like when I, when I, so I take these boxing lessons and I know some of my students know that I've got boxing gloves in my office, I miss my office. And you know, I never thought of myself really as a fighter like that. But what the boxing lessons have, and there's boxing is probably the, the polar opposite from yoga, right? But in both of these activities, we learn so much about how our brains and our bodies and our minds and our emotions, everything is interconnected and interlayered. And we can learn how to translate and transfer some of those experiences, whether we're in a yoga class or in a boxing lesson or in some other creative artistic pursuit and transfer that over to our lawyering persona. We are not just law students and lawyers. We are artists and athletes and writers and creative spirits. So I do wanna introduce these, these concepts that I've been studying. I've been studying a lot about sports psychology and performance psychology to see how we can take a lot of these, these training mechanisms that athletes and performers and certain types of artists are using in their development, their performance, and they're getting help from all these different coaches. You know, we don't stigmatize athletes and performers for having coaches in all these different areas, but for some reason, sometimes in our legal profession, we're not so tolerant about hearing about, um, you know, people that are asking for help. So we're hoping that we can change that. And as I was researching this, I read this book by George Mumford, who wrote a book called The Mindful Athlete. And he was actually a, a performance coach who worked with Phil Jackson, the, the longtime coach of the um, Chicago Bulls and also the LA Lakers. And in Mumford's book, he mentions this concept, concept of eustress, starting with EU. And the, the letters EU are Greek. They come from the Greek for the word good. And I know sometimes we always hear, oh, stress is good for you. And I'm like, no, stress is not good for us. But what I learned in this book is that there's a middle zone between stress and distress. And if we can think about, you know, we all have stress going on in our lives, but sometimes we sort of leap immediately from the stressor that an initial thing that causes us stress, we, we sort of leap right into distress where actually if we become more mindful and aware of, of through yoga and through different movement activities, we become more aware of what is going on in our brains and our minds and our bodies, we might be able to, to teach ourselves to linger in the eustress zone in a, you know, something that does push us a little bit out of, it pushes into a little bit of discomfort, but not to the degree of distress. And so that's where we really want to start to get to know ourselves better. You know, Socrates, our, our favorite friend, Socrates, the inventor of the nice Socratic method, he had a mantra, know thyself. We, we can get to know ourselves and then start to be able to control whether we, we leap from stress to distress or if we can linger in that eustress zone and start to trust ourselves, trust our systems, trust um, all these frameworks that we can put into place. The other sports concept, and also this is a medical concept, 
I was reading along and I discovered this concept of prehabilitation. Now, we've, a lot of us have heard about rehabilitation and maybe in the medical realm or in the sports realm, when we get injured, or hurt, we rehab that joint or that, that muscle or that bone. But prehabilitation, I think is such a cool concept, especially for us as law students and lawyers, because we can get ahead of this. We don't need to wait until we are in a, a crisis, a stress crisis. Instead, we can start to think of ourselves as these athletes and performers and think about how we can start now, today, to consider prehabbing. How can we prepare in advance for the stressors we know are coming? There's another concept, which I haven't put on the screen, called allostasis, and I'm like so proud of myself. I'm learning these scientific terms. You know, our bodies are used to trying to strive for homeostasis, which is like even keel. But there's this other concept called allostasis in which we actually, we, we um, hold on, I got, I got my professor notes here. Allostasis is a, achieving stability through change. So what we wanna do is anticipate these stressors that we know we're gonna have, and but prepare our brains and bodies and minds and emotional mindsets to be able to attack those stressors in advance. And that's all part of prehab as well. So you all might have seen this already, but in 2016, the American Bar Association in, in um, conjunction with like 17 other entities founded a national task force on lawyer well-being. And in 2017, they issued a report about the state of our profession. And in it, they identify these six pillars of lawyer well-being. And I feel like this ties into this concept of treating ourselves as scholar athletes or scholar performers as well. Because again, just like athletes and performers, we can't just focus on one dimension of our lives. We obviously focus on our intellectual dimension. We, we focus on the substance and the procedure of law, but to be great and healthy and, and happy and full of wellness as, as law students and lawyers, we really need to start tending to these six dimensions of well-being. Obviously, our emotional and, and mental health is incredibly important, but we don't talk about that a lot in law school. Um, occupational is, do we have a good fit? Not only are we intellectually engaged at work, but is it a good occupational, environmental fit? Physical, we're going to talk about tonight. Spiritual, spiritual can mean a whole lot of different things to us, but what it really comes down to is meaning. Do we have meaning in the work that we're doing? And then social, especially now when we're all sort of isolated and separated and not together as we would love to be, can we deepen these connections that we have? So as athletes, performers, artists, however we wanna view ourselves, we can't just focus on one dimension because if we focus on all six of these dimensions, when we do hit that stressor in one dimension, maybe we have a really tough intellectual problem we have to solve, our other dimensions, according to the experts that study this, our other dimensions lift us up. So if we're feeling low in one area, if we've bolstered the other five, the other five can get us through the, the hardships in the one area. I'm actually gonna, when, when I segue over to Professor Ames in a few minutes, I'm gonna put an article in, in the chat, a LinkedIn article in the chat that talks about some of these dimensions. So really quickly, um, how do we start to do this? Well, a lot of the sports psychologists and performance psychologists and also people that write about creativity talk about setting up a training system. So we, we set up systems to help us build strength in those six dimensions. We practice that training, we make mistakes, we stumble, we, we try again. And then when we step into the performance arena as law students in the classroom or as lawyers in the courtroom or the boardroom or the conference room, we, we might feel that sense of nervousness. I, I always confide and every time I do a presentation, I was nervous tonight. I had to walk around my apartment doing my power pose from Professor Amy Cuddy's TED talk about power poses. I was nervous again, but then I had to remind myself, oh wait, you know, I have a system, I gotta trust my system and then step into the moment with fortitude. On the screen, there's a quote from the um, amazing choreographer, Twyla Tharp. And she wrote this book about the creative process. And she says the same thing, you know, whenever she's starting a new project, she has that sense of overwhelm, but then she remembers 
wait, I've done this before. It was good then. I'm going to trust my process and I'm going to do it again. So we can do the same thing as law students and lawyers. Set up a system for all those dimensions and then trust our system. I want to mention one other concept that I've been learning about in performance psychology and also this realm of psychology called positive psychology. And it's this concept of flow. And there's this amazing book called Flow by this psychologist. His, you pronounce his name, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi. His name is on the screen. And he talks about how, you know, when we're training ourselves, a lot of times our, our level of challenge exceeds our skill level. So obviously when we're learning, a new thing in law school or we're practicing law and we're maybe taking on a case that's that's new to us our challenge level exceeds our skill level but eventually they level out and we hit this state of flow i know for me personally that i feel like i'm in a state of flow and the world seems to disappear and the pandemic disappears and time stops when i'm writing like writing is really i love it it's very challenging and hard for me but I, I hit a state of flow when i'm in it and and then i emerge from it and i feel almost disoriented and dizzy but i'm happy i'm exhilarated every one of you on this call has some aspect of your life or your professional life when you hit that state of flow so what our, our goal is with with bolstering these dimensions in our life is to put ourselves in that challenge level but then our skills rise to the level of the challenge and then we start to pay attention to when we hit that flow state and then we can try to cultivate these flow states more often and that will help us be more fulfilled in practice and in our lives so i just had to give a little shout out to a brooklynite jay-z because this is one of his lyrics don't ever go with the flow we can be the flow so that should be our, our mantra for the next couple months let's be the flow Okay. Thank you, Professor Brown. So I'm going to talk a bit about just five quick tips to incorporate wellness into your daily routine. And the first is to set daily intentions. So there's all this research out there about how setting intentions actually frames frames your day, frames who you are, frames your goals. And, and those intentions do not have to be as elaborate as you may think. So it could just be um, setting, in, setting an intention of how you want to feel a particular day, what you'd like to do, what you'd like to attract, um, things you'd like to let go of. All these tend to help your focus. And once you have those intentions, it's then easier to set a schedule. So once you have those intentions and you know what's important, you know what you want to attract, you know what you want to do, you know how you want to feel, you know what you want to let go of, then you look at setting your schedule and that'll help you to prioritize the things you need to do. And one of the things that you need to prioritize are relationships. And I know you're like, oh, of course I prioritize relationships. I prioritize them with my family and my friends. And that's those are certain types of relationships. And yes, you should prioritize those. But ones that aren't often mentioned are, are your peer relationships with your colleagues. And those are important relationships because they help you to kind of get you through sometimes as Professor Brown mentioned, like there may be some op occupational dimensions that you're struggling through. If you have those connections with your colleagues, you can kind of work through those. And they're different from familiar relationships and friendship relationships. And having those people who are doing the same thing you're doing are important. And sometimes with those um, relationships to prioritize them, we often think that um, we have to say yes all the time and we don't. So sometimes by maintaining a professional relationship is saying no to that committee, no to that bar association, no, no to serving on that panel, because you know, going back to your intentions, what's important to you. And you know that you can't do the best work that you're going to do if you are not fulfilling those intentions. So kind of thinking about how that plays all together. And then Professor Brown mentioned this as well, more with Socrates, but knowing yourself. And this is something that no one can do for you. And I'm sure you've gotten to the stage of life and you realize that no one can do it for you, even though you want someone to do it for you, right? Um, but, but there really is a form of self-awareness that helps you to kind of prioritize your own wellness. If you know what's important to you, if you know what, um, 
what you're passionate about, if you know what you're dispassionate about, all these things tend to help you to know yourself and actually incorporate who you want to be in your daily life. And of course, we've gotten this, we're always told, scientists say it all the time, you need to move more. But the problem is now we're in a pandemic and we're kind of all on these Zoom screens all the time. And I know that we've all been, we've all probably stopped tracking our watches and our phones that tell us how much activity we do, but it doesn't take much to kind of get moving. So what I'd like to transition now is to our chair yoga sequence. So again, you if you came a little bit later, all that you'll need is a chair and a stable one something that's stable. Um, so, so try, if you're on a rolling chair, I advise you to not use a rolling chair. If you are on, I said, a really old kind of rickety chair, do not use that. Something that's stable or stay, stable seat. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Just give me a moment. To try and get try and get some music, but we'll see. I just need you to type in the chat if you could hear it or not. Okay. All right. So, what I, so, so we want to start in seated mountain pose. So your hands, they could be at heart center, they could be on the top of your knees, your feet are at 12 o'clock, you should feel grounded, shoulders, roll your shoulders back, sit up tall, and then take this moment to take an intention for this moment. Remember, intentions don't have to be for long periods of time for this, for this sequence. It could just be, I just want to be present in the moment. And then just take a moment to breathe in and out. So as you breathe in, your belly expands. As you breathe out, you're releasing the air from your belly. And let's do three more breaths at your own pace. your right hand goes down toward the floor. And you're just going to lean. And you can look over your left shoulder if that's comfortable and just hold it. You can go as far as the floor, go not very far at all, whatever's comfortable to you. Okay, let's switch sides. Come up through center and now lean to your left. Look over your right shoulder. If you look up, you can look back, open your chest, open your throat. Come back to center, 
Seated Mountain. I'm going to do some knee taps, which are always fun. They kind of energize and energize us throughout the day. So you're going to sit tall. You're going to lift your right knee. And you're going to rotate your torso and you're just going to bring your knee, I'm sorry, your elbow to your knee. You bring your knee down as you go. You can keep it up. You can keep your leg on the floor if that's more comfortable. Whatever feels most comfortable. And just try and do about five on each side. Once you've done your five, switch. Right hand goes up, left knee comes up. And just five times. And notice the difference in your body and what muscles you feel working, how your breath has changed. And when you're finished, We'll meet in seated mountain. Okay, next is a hip opener pose. We're going to lift your right ankle. So lift your right leg, put your right ankle over your left knee. So it should be kind of like a figure four. You can look, you can reach your hands up, bring your hands to heart center. You could fold over your knee as far as you can go. You can stay right here if this is quite uncomfortable enough. It is up to you. And just breathe. If you notice, if you ground down your left foot to the floor, you'll get a different sensation. You're really grounded. So you could stay right here, or you can twist to your right and open up your arms and stretch them apart for a deeper stretch. You can reach, reach your left, your right hand up to the sky and your gaze over your middle finger. Come back to heart center. Put both feet on the floor, seated mountain. We're gonna do the same thing on the left side. So bring your left leg up, left ankle on your right knee. Flex that left foot if you can. Hands to heart center and you could lift up, reach and fold, or you can stay with your hands at heart center, whichever is right for you. Okay, when you're ready, you can stay right here if this is comfortable for you, or you can twist to your left. So you can just twist and then open up your arms, reach your left arm up to the ceiling or to the sky, gaze over your right middle finger and hold. And try and take note of the sensations you feel. And remember to stay grounded down in your right foot. Now we're gonna do my most acrobatic pose of the evening. You're gonna do extended left leg lift. So you're gonna lift up your right knee, sit tall, lean back, lift, hug, hug your right knee into your chest and then extend that leg if you'd like. So with your foot flexed, you can hold your hamstring, you can hold your calf, you can hold the inside or outside of your foot. We're just going to hold it for about 15 seconds. My leg has never felt heavier. Ignore the bottom of my foot. It's trying to spice you don't so I'm not offending anyone with the bottom of my foot. Okay. 
and do the same thing on the other side. So sit tall, lean back, hug your right knee, your left knee into your chest. With your foot flexed, extend it out, you can hold onto your thigh, your hamstring, your calf, or your foot, whichever works best for you. If you feel really advanced, you can do a twist. And release. Come back to seated mountain. Now we're gonna do um, warrior two. So what you need to do, this is why a chair is essential, stable chair. You're gonna scooch all the way to the edge of your chair. So scooch, scooch, scooch. And then you're gonna to turn to your sitting sideways with your right side to the right side of your chair. And then you're gonna keep your right foot stable. And then you're gonna extend your left foot back. So it's like a seated warrior. You're gonna reach your hands up. You can open up to warrior two. You gaze over your right middle finger. Remember, you're bringing your shoulder blades together. You can see if the sensation changes if you lift your palms. Then you can come back up through center to warrior one. And then if you'd like, you can actually just twist on your chair and look over your right shoulder or to the right side or, or keep your gaze to the front, whichever is most comfortable. When you finish, come back up through center. You're gonna do extended side angle. So your right arm comes to the top of your right foot. And reach. You can keep your gaze straight ahead or look up at your lifted hand. And just notice how the sensations change. We're gonna come back up, seated mountain. Now we're gonna do the same thing on the left side. So again, scooch to the edge of your chair and you're gonna turn parallel. So your left side is on the side of the chair. Then you're gonna scoop your right foot back and then your hands come up. Your belly pulls in, shoulders come back and down. You're gonna open it up to warrior two. Your gaze goes over your left middle finger. Come back up through center and if you'd like, you twist on your chair. Extended side angle. So ground down in that left foot. And come back to center. Scoot closer to you so I can see you. And now we're just going to do a body scan. So seated mount, seated. Put your hand on your chest and just close your eyes, soften your gaze where you feel more comfortable. And just breathe in and out. In and out. And then take a moment to remind yourself of your intention. And then let's just do a quick body scan. So your feet should be grounded and just concentrate on the right side of your body. So from the top of your head to your toe. So start there and just do a scan. Check in and check in on the right side of your head, the right side of your face, your neck, your shoulder, your arm, your elbow. your hand, your fingers, your hip, your 
thigh, your knee, your shin, your ankle, your foot, and all those five toes on that right side. And now let's do the same thing on the left. And you're starting at the top of your head all the way down to your toes. So your head, your face, your neck, your shoulders, your arms, your elbow, your hand, your fingers, your hip, your thigh, your knee, your calf, your ankle, your foot, and your toes. And then just tune into the center line of your body. Including your heart center. And really tune into your body, the physicality of it, the spirituality of it, and see what else your body needs in this moment to make this practice complete. and then take it. And then bring your hands to heart center. And then bring your hands, your thumbs to the center of your forehead, open up your palms. And you can invite, invite in whatever you'd like to. You can invite in joy, happiness, peace, abundance, love. Then bring your hands back to your Anjali Mudra, your heart center. And the light in me honors the light in each and every one of you. As we bow, we say Namaste. All right, well, thank you all for joining me in that practice. Hopefully, some of those poses will be beneficial as you as you are going about your days, hopefully some of them you can work into, trying to just keep moving and to keep you more centered and grounded. Now, Professor Brown and I allotted the last 20 minutes for questions, comments. We can discuss the ways in which you try and preserve wellness in your daily life, whatever you'd like to share. And I'll turn off the music. Thank you so much, Professor Ames. I wanted to just share, um, Four other thoughts before we open it up for questions. And you can pop questions in the chat. You can raise your Zoom hand. Um, so while we were doing that amazing practice, and I definitely do not slow down enough in my day, so that really helped me slow down. It just made me think of four other things that might be helpful for all of us. So that I, I love the when I got out of law school and when I started teaching, I was really mad at Socrates for inventing the Socratic method. I was like furious with Socrates. But then I started reading about how Socrates really was, um, like walking around the streets of Athens, just asking questions. And the, the, the mantra, or the, um, the mission statement, know thyself, was really his way of just learning and having intellectual humility. And I think that's what we're even doing here right now is having intellectual humility about well-being because we're all running ourselves ragged. And it's it's really fun sometimes to just stop and learn how we can be, be better, be better at what we do in every way. And then the second thing I wanted to share was, was the breathing that Professor Ames just helped us do. Um, I realized when I'm doing these boxing classes or boxing lessons, I hold my breath all the time. And, and when I've shared with you, I have extreme public speaking anxiety. So even speaking at a faculty meeting, you know, my, my, my uh, heart beats racing really fast and I'm sweating and I, I blush a lot. So that happens. But what the boxing has taught me is to, to breathe. I have to catch my breath so I can keep doing it. And then I realized 
now when I'm in the faculty meetings and that's happening, I remember that, okay, when I breathed in the boxing lesson, I was okay. So I'm gonna breathe now in the faculty meeting or in class or right now when I'm speaking to you. So there's this exercise that I can get the link for you all. It's called the 10 breaths exercise. And you just slowly with intention, breathe in and breathe out for really 10 really long breaths. And I've started doing that either in the boxing thing or in, in the stressful meetings. And it's, it's all like layering on top of each other. And then two more quick things I'll share with you and then we'll get to questions. Um, for those of you that might get caught up a lot in your, in your ruminating or worrying or thinking, another resource that has really helped me through the pandemic is um, Julia Cameron wrote the book, The Artist's Way. And one of her techniques is to write morning pages and so it's three pages of longhand writing in a notebook, on a scrap piece of paper, not typing, not texting on your phone, but actually handwriting three pages. And that might seem like a lot, but you could actually just write even like, I have nothing to say, I have nothing to say, I have nothing to say, and then boom, something you know, that you've been thinking about all night or you dreamt about pops on the page. And you, the point is not to edit this or read it again. The point is just to get that brain clutter out of our minds so then we can step into our day. And the last thing I'll share that I discovered in the pandemic, there's a great book by a woman named Barbara Fredrickson. She's a social psychologist. She wrote a book called Positivity and she recommends trying as as professor ames was mentioning different emotions like like love i heard and it, so so barbara fredrickson lists 10 positive emotions in her book things like gratitude and joy and awe i love the emotion of awe and she recommends creating a positivity portfolio where you, we're all stuck at home right so we have stuff lying around and she recommends you go around your apartment or your home and you collect artifacts, objects like pictures, you know, ticket stubs from concerts when we used to do that. And you, you cultivate a portfolio around that emotion. And then just for like five minutes a day for like a week, you sit with those objects and try to cultivate that emotion. I tried it last like three months ago. I chose awe because I missed traveling and I missed my concerts and I missed live you know, exercise classes and things like that. And it just really has ripple effects in so many different dimensions as we were talking about before. So those are just four little snippets. Okay, I've been talking too much now. So if anybody has questions or things they wanna share, I'm so happy to see, I see at least three or four of my students here. <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna use the Socratic method to call on you. Does anyone have other practices that that you have experimented with? Is it okay to just? Yeah, why don't we just do it that way? <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> um, so I love yoga. I've been practicing yoga and meditation my whole life, never more than during the pandemic. Um, but pre-COVID, my stressor was the LSAT. Um, and I found two things that I never thought could see myself doing, but once we are out of the COVID lockdown a little more, I would highly, highly recommend them to any of you. One of them is a sensory deprivation tank, um, which I found at a place called Sacred Waters, which may or may not continue to exist. Um, but I don't know if any of you have ever done it, but it really is awesome. I mean, it's like you're in a fancy bath and then all of a sudden there's nothing and you can either freak out or you can calm your mind. And that's what it did for me is calmed my mind um, once I stopped freaking out. Um, <laughs> and then the second thing is uh, available in New York, at least you know, COVID aside, and it's called Goku, G-O-K-U, and it's Japanese head massage. So they spend an entire hour massaging nothing but your head. And if you're somebody who's thinking a lot, <laughs> it really just releases a lot. Some people fall asleep. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that the Sacred Waters, the sensory deprivation tank place, founded by lawyers. <laughs> So 
again, it's like, sounds wacko. Never thought I'd be doing those things, but they got me through the entire LSAT journey. So that's my two cents. Amazing. How long are you in the sensory deprivation tank? An hour. An hour. Okay. That's amazing. And I always wished it would be a little longer, honestly, because you need like 10 minutes of freak out time. <laughs> and then you start to feel kind of things that are like maybe hurting in your physical body. And by the time you get over that, you can either fall asleep or meditate. And when you kind of really have lost it, like totally fallen asleep or totally gone lost in meditation, then this music comes on and you have to get out and leave. So <laughs> sounds like a long time, but it's not really. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm going to type some of these sources into the chat um, while somebody else gets brave and wants to speak. <laughs> so it was Goku, I think. G-O-K-U, Goku. Yeah, it, for a long time, it was only in Japan, but it is now in New York and it's not cheap, but boy, does it help. <laughs> And then Sacred Waters is the place that had the sensory deprivation tank. And I just know that they were clean and safe and fancy, but I'm sure there are other places too that offer it. And you can have music or not music. You can have colored lights or complete darkness. You can bring your own music. It's cool. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. I'm glad I could make it. Are you a perspective law student, Rachel, No, So you just took the LSAT? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I don't want to tell you, take up too much time to tell you my whole life story, but um, <laughs> I'm a newspaper editor, and I made the decision three years ago to transition to become a lawyer. And so I applied to 14 schools. I've been accepted to five so far. One of them is Brooklyn. Yay. So still waiting to hear from a few more, but... <laughs> That's exciting. Thank you. Thank you. I can't find my mechanical hands. Um, I'm a, a Brooklyn Law School uh, alum, uh, 1981, and I have to applaud both of you professors and from the bottom of my heart for doing, uh, speaking about attorney wellness, because I have to say for the close to 40 years I'm practicing, I, I'm a solo practitioner right out of law school, and then weekends and hobby and my own time was meditation. And if there are law students out there not to preach or anything, but pay attention to this and do it integrated as the professors are suggesting now, because otherwise you end up like a lot of the solos suffering in silence thinking this is so hard and you're entering, you're about to enter a very stressful profession. It's a marvelous profession, but it is stressful. And I wish I had the advantage of what both of you were talking and practicing tonight way back when, but thank you. And I'm so glad that the bar associations are paying attention to attorney wellness. Now it's never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that attorneys would be talking about attorney wellness. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Linda. Do you, do you mind sharing what type of meditation that you, that you do? I, I started with Vipassana, insight meditation, watching your breath. Um, but, and now I'm with a Tibetan teacher and I'm about ready to start a two year program to learn, to become certified to teach meditation. Um, and my goal is to teach it to lawyers and to law students <laughs> because I just feel, first of all, for me personally, it integrates and it's meaningful. It's what you mentioned. One must find meaning. The spirituality, it taps into the intellectual part and the meaning making. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's one of the dimensions, the, the spiritual and meaning dimension. It also, um, just to give us some more resources to tap into, the I put in the chat the 10 breaths exercise comes from a psychologist called Paul Bloom. And I think it's Paul Bloom. I hope I have that name right. No, I might, I might have the name wrong. I'll, I'll figure out who it is. But this meditation exercise, the 10 breaths, 
there's science that shows that it changes our, our brain chemistry. Meditation, it actually can make us smarter, you guys. <laughs> it really can't. So it changes our, um, I'm going to, it changes the thickness of our gray matter. This is legit science. And I rebelled against meditation for so long. And now that I'm learning the actual science around it, it's good for us. And it doesn't take that long and we can do it. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, there's a, another psychologist named Paul or another um, doc, medical science um, expert named um, John Rady, R-A-T-E-Y. And he talks about physical movement. So even if you're not into exercise, any physical movement that's raising our heart level above resting counts as physical movement. So all of us can do this in whatever way, you know, even sitting in a chair as Professor Ames showed us. And physical exercise makes our brains stronger too. So as lawyers, we can't not do it. it it's, it's an investment in our intellectual dimension to actually move our bodies and do meditation. So yes, this is very exciting. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Linda. Anyone else wanna share? I'll jump in. Hey, Heidi. Hey, Aisha. Hey, everybody. Um, one thing is with my son, I mean, they have the same stressors of zooming in all day and sitting. So if you come across any like suggestions for videos or mantras, or things that are good for kids to do separately or with parents, that would be great. We did mantras a couple of times in the spring and he seemed to really like it, but I just need to keep following through with it. He, he does some yoga, but we, I need to be more consistent with him. That's it. Hearing some fantastic music coming from somewhere. Oops. Yeah, so I think Headspace, I know one of my friends uses Headspace with her five-year-old daughter. Um, and then also if you, I'm not gonna, if you use A-L-E-X-A, -E um, I'm not gonna say her because she will activate. <laughs> right and join us in this call which I don't want um but if you use her sometimes if you would ask her for some some kids meditation and things like that and she has some short sequences does anyone else want to chime in oh, I will say Rachel I did try the sensory deprivation and I freaked out for the entire time <laughs> Like whole hour, I was like, I can't take this. Um, being in a tube in water just made, did not, I did not make it to that point. So I'm impressed by the fact that you were able to relax in only 10 minutes. I was like, every time I got there, I, like, I was like, okay, I'm relaxed. And then I'd be like, oh my gosh. Um, so, so I'm impressed by you, Rachel. Thank you. I mean, I went back once a month after that and I, I get the impulse to like freak out, but I promise you that I think as with exercise or yoga or anything else, once you're over that hump, you realize, oh, why haven't I been doing this the whole time? You know, <laughs> like, and I think it's especially important for law students and I'm sure lawyers too, like, because there's a tendency to obsess, right? To just go, 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 go and never let go of that thing that you're working on, but that can actually hurt performance, right? Yeah, definitely. It's, I struggled a lot with ruminating and worrying about making mistakes. And, and I so wish I could go back 20 years and redo all those stressful depositions and courtroom appearances. And that's why I loved writing so much because I could take time to process everything, but the performance moments, you know, I wasn't trained in any of the stuff that we've talked about tonight. So it's so important for us to realize when we are sort of spinning um, and ruminating. And one thing that I still wake up at three o'clock in the morning, I woke up the other day at three o'clock in the morning worrying about my class that I have to teach on Tuesday. Because <laughs> we're back, you know, in the class, well, in our virtual classroom. And I realized, okay, again, it's, it's like that, that noticing, okay, I notice that I'm, that I'm covering the same territory over and over again, I'm not sleeping, what can I do? I can stop, it's kind of, I kind of like the firefighter mantra of stop, drop and roll. Like when you, when you notice that your heart's beating really fast or that you're think you're in a thinking trap, stop, trust your system, you know, and then 
with the worrying, especially when it comes to law related stuff, I had to start setting a time limit on myself <laughs> and saying, okay, you're allowed to worry because, you know, we worry. It's okay to worry. But I would tell myself, you know, you can only worry about this for five more minutes. Like you get five minutes and then you're going to do something different. And so it's about sort of jarring ourselves out of that, that what we're very accustomed to. It's like that concept of allostasis I was mentioning, which I still need to research more. We have to push ourselves into, you know, new strategies to, to disrupt, to put some friction between us and what we're used to doing. So for me, like the five minute rule, I'm like, okay, you can stress for five more minutes. And then I set a timer and then I'm like, nope, okay, now I got to do that 10 breaths thing or get up and move or whatever. But we have to come up with these systems and train ourselves to trust them. So our brains and our bodies can work at their peak performance levels. And that's why I like this whole performer analogy or the athlete analogy, or even the artist, you know, artists have systems to get the work done. They don't just float and around and create, like they have real serious artists have processes and we can treat ourselves, you know, law students and lawyers the same way, have a system, honor our system. And when our system needs work, we fix the system and we, we disrupt it a little bit and we try some new things. I know my dad had a very simple well-being tip when I, he still abides by it now. So if I called him and I was upset about something or I was upset about anything, he had like, he would be like, what did you eat today? And um, so, and I'd usually be nothing, but he'd be like, go get something to eat, take a nap. Like he'd let me cry it out or be upset. Mm -hmm. um, go get something to eat, take a nap, and then call me back and, and we'll devise a plan. So you had that time, similar to what Professor Brown is saying, as far as you had the time to kind of feel what you felt. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, how can I muster, um, you know, like bolster myself with, with any type of nutrition and rest and then come back to it. And so it's a very, it was a very simple three-step process, but it's gotten me through lots of things of just what, what have I eaten today? Or has it really been contributing to um, how I'm feeling right now, even if it is valid, but just kind of really, really grounding you and kind of really being present as to what's happening in your body. Yeah, Professor Ames, there was a question in the chat and maybe you answered this already, but um, someone's asking, let's see, sorry, I'm scooting back. Um, Bessie's asking any good Zoom classes or apps for yoga? I know we talked about apps for meditation, but did you mention apps for yoga as well? Yes, yes, so the, yeah, like BLS has, has yoga with Adrienne, I believe, or Adrian, And then also like there's an app, Down Dog, if you're a student, they offer a really great, um, like a really great plan, like it's really, it's pretty inexpensive. And then, um, and what you do with Down Dog is that you compile like how long you want your yoga class to be. So it can be 15 minutes, it could be two hours. And then you say, say what you want to focus on and actually devise using an algorithm. Uh, Fantastic. Yes. Good. And it looks like there's some um, references to the New York City Bar Association too. That's great. That's exciting. And then also most like if there's a local studio by you, most of them are offering um, some free Instagram live courses and things like that. So you could check out with a nominal donation sometimes. So I think we're right at seven o'clock. Um, but I know Professor Ames, um, Aisha and I both would welcome you reaching out to us individually. We're both on the Brooklyn Law School website.